Today I'm talking about chapter 14 of No Man Knows My History, Disaster in Kirtland. Welcome back to Candlewick Library. I'm Cheryl. I'm back today with my No Man Knows My History series. I took off a few weeks and now I'm back with the next chapter. Today I'm in chapter 14, Disaster in Kirtland. In the last video, I talked about how Joseph Smith was starting to have money problems in the church. He really needed money for the printing of the Book of Mormon. He had to get money from Martin Harris to be able to print it. And the church is really hurting for money at this time. They had gone to Salem to try to find treasure that Joseph had had a a revelation that he would find treasure there and of course they didn't. Now he's returned from Salem and they still have all these money problems. She starts out the chapter, although Joseph had returned from Salem without a chest of money, he was not exactly empty-handed. He had succeeded in New York City in borrowing $5,600 from Halstead Haynes and company. Later, Hiram Smith and Oliver Cowdery succeeded in obtaining credit in the East for about $60,000 worth of goods. These windfalls made it easy for him to borrow further on a smaller scale in the Kirtland area. Timothy Martindale loaned him 5,000, Winthrop Eaton 1,150, and the Bank of Giaga 3,000. In a minute, I'm going to show a chart that shows all of the debts that they were incurring during this time. And you can still find the record of these things in the courthouse in Ohio, where there were suits brought on to try to recover the money. But Joseph understood perfectly that continued borrowing only postponed the day of reckoning. For two months, he planned with his brethren how best to bring about its liquidation. The result of these deliberations was the Kirtland Safety Society Bank Company, organized in November 1836. This bank was expected to solve their problems with their debt by being able to use these banknotes and exchange them for hard money. She goes on to say that at any time other than the mid-30s, such a plan would have been mad. But now, because of the frenetic land speculation, there was an enormous demand for money and a need for new banking facilities. And all that was required to start a bank in the West was an unlimited amount of nerve and the necessary capital to pay the engraver and the printer for making the notes. The number of authorized banks operating in the state had jumped from 11 in 1830 to 33 in 1836. Besides this, there were nine institutions that were doing this unauthorized. Banknote circulation in 1836 was 70% greater than in 1835. There were at least 300 different kinds of authorized notes to say nothing of the illegal bills and counterfeiting that was going on. So now added to that comes Joseph Smith's bank. Subscriptions to the capital stock ranged from 1,000 to $500,000. Most of the subscribers paying in Kirtland Boomtown lots of at five and six times normal value. Joseph estimated his own land in Kirtland at $300,000 and stated that the whole capital stock of the bank was comprised in land lying within two square miles. The bank was said to have been established by a revelation from God, and rumors skipped through town that the prophet had predicted that like Aaron's rod, it would swallow up all the other banks and grow and flourish and spread from the rivers to the ends of the earth and survive when all others should be laid in ruins. That has been said by a few different people at the time, but that exact quote was from Warren Parrish. The messenger and advocate announced the organization of the bank in January 1837 and published an appeal which said in part, we invite the brethren from abroad to call on us and take stock in our safety society. And we would remind them also of the sayings of Isaiah, surely the isles shall wait for me and the ships of Tarshish first to bring thy sons from far, their silver and their gold, not their banknotes, with them unto the name of the Lord thy God. And that is printed in the history of the church. On January 1st, 1837, the same day that the printed banknotes arrived in Kirtland, there came the disconcerting news that the Ohio legislature had refused to incorporate the bank. Its operation thus became illegal in the same week that they announced that it was going to happen. Of course, Joseph said that it was just because they were Mormon. Because we were Mormons, the legislature raised some frivolous excuse on which they refused to grant us those banking privileges they so freely granted to others. But actually, during this time period, there were a lot of people trying to start banks like this, and there was only one that was accepted. So them being Mormon might have had something to do with it, but was not the only reason. So did Joseph let this stop him? Did they decide, okay, well, I guess we can't do the bank. On January 2nd, the Kirtland Safety Society Bank became the Kirtland Safety Society Anti-Banking Company. The already engraved banknotes were stamped with the prefix anti before and the suffix ing after the word bank. And I will show a picture of that now. This was the exact banknote that they were giving out at the time. And now in this picture, I circled the anti and the ing so that you can see how they just stamped all of them so they wouldn't have to reprint them. Joseph expected this to let him get around the rules that he thought were unfair. So now begins the most prosperous two weeks in Kirtland, Ohio for the Mormons. 
Everyone's pockets bulge with bills. It gets really interesting when you really delve into the details of this banking society or anti-banking society. There are multiple accounts that say when you would go into the bank vault, there would be all these boxes lined up that were marked $1,000. But actually, these boxes were filled with sand, lead, old iron, stone, and other combustibles. And then they each had a top layer of bright 50 cent silver coins on top. So anyone who was suspicious about the bank stability could go in there and look into the box and they would see this layer of silver coins, not realizing that it was only one layer and that underneath it was a bunch of junk. CG Webb said, the effect of those boxes was like magic. They created general confidence in the solidity of the bank and that beautiful paper money went like hotcakes. For about a month, it was the best money in the country. Joseph's secretary, Warren Parrish, was also the cashier for a short time, and he wrote in 1838, I have been astonished to hear him declare that we had $60,000 in specie in our vaults and 600000 at our command, when we had not to exceed 6000 and could not command any more. Also that we had but about $10,000 of our bills in circulation, when he, as cashier of that institution, knew that there were at least $150,000. So Warren Parrish is going to be somebody that a lot of apologists nowadays will try to make out as a bad guy, and you'll find out in a minute that that started then. But I think he can be trusted. From everything I've read, I believe what he's saying. So he's basically saying here that Joseph was telling everybody that they had more money than they did in the bank, and that they had less banknotes out than they actually did. So he's exaggerating it in a different direction on both ends. The Painesville Republican, which was a newspaper that was generally friendly to the Mormons, on January 19th, 1837, wrote, with respect to the ability of the Kirtland Society to redeem their notes, we know nothing farther than what the report says. It is said they have a large amount in specie on hand and have the means of obtaining much more if necessary. If these facts be so, its circulation in some shape would be beneficial to the community. But Cleveland merchants were alarmed by the insinuations made of maybe that wasn't true. They began to refuse all the banknotes that came from here. But that was not until after about $36,000 worth of notes had already passed through the city. Merchants in Buffalo and New York had already scorned them from the beginning and no banks would touch them. So pretty soon they all started coming back to the city of Kirtland. Joseph redeemed a good number before he realized that the run on the bank was about to ruin him. Many times in this series, I have used the Saints book to kind of compare and contrast what the LDS church is telling its members about its history. Now that they're being more transparent and open, although I've shown before how sometimes this book has a different story than they even have on their website in the Gospel Topics essays and in the Gospel Topics, although I did just find out that they're taking down the Gospel Topics and they're going to be putting something else, I think, in its place but sometimes those stories don't even match. I started getting really annoyed as I was reading the chapter in the Saints book because the entire thing was blamed on one man. And this guy was not a friend to the Mormons or to Joseph Smith. He was a critical person, but he did not cause it. And they make it sound like he, that he was going around hoarding all of the banknotes and he came in to do a run on the bank. There might be some truth to him hoarding some of them and coming in with them, but he was not the main reason that the bank, that it failed and it is very disingenuous it is stretching the truth to make members believe when you're reading this that it was all the fault of one anti-mormon everyone possessing kirtland bank bills now tried desperately to get rid of them everyone not just the one guy by february 1st they were selling for 12 and one half cents on the dollar fg williams and warren Parrish took over the offices of president and cashier in a final effort to try to salvage this. From its beginning, the bank had been operating illegally. A state law fixed the penalty for such an offense at $1,000 and guaranteed informers a share of the fine. On March 24th, Joseph's lawyers tried to prove that the statute had not been enforced at the time of the bank's organization, but they lost the case and Joseph was ordered to pay the $1,000 penalty and costs. You can find the record of this trial in Chardon, Ohio's courthouse. Warren Parrish resigned as cashier, he left the church, and he began openly to describe the banking methods of the prophet. Parrish was later accused of absconding with $25,000, but if he took the sum, it must have been a worthless banknote, since that amount of specie in the vaults would have saved the bank, at least during Joseph's time as cashier. I found that really funny in a way that they blamed him and said, oh, Warren Parrish, because he left the church and started telling people of what was happening at the bank and started telling the truth, of course they have to make him look bad. They have to destroy his reputation. This is a pattern from the very beginning of the church all the way till now. Accusing him of leaving with $25,000 
when that would have saved the bank that we know if you if you stop and think about it you know that it didn't have twenty five thousand dollars in that bank and so it like she said it had to have been banknotes and those banknotes were worthless and other people took lots of banknotes brigham young had a bunch that he later brought to utah and so there's no reason to believe what they say about Warren Parish here. The next thing that you'll hear a lot of church apologists and members say that they've been told is, well, it was no big deal that this bank failed because all of the banks in that area failed at this time. And that is true. However, that was in May. Within a single month, 800 banks containing $120 million in deposits suspended operations. The panic of 1837 had arrived and a nation gone loco over land settled down to its day of retribution. However, you cannot blame that for what happened in Kirtland because the Kirtland Bank collapsed four months before that. And it actually continued issuing notes until June. On June 29th, Rigdon was brought to court for making spurious money and the practice was finally stopped. It was not until August, however, that Joseph formally renounced the bank and the messenger and advocate and warned his people against accepting the bank notes. When Joseph told them to stop taking bank notes, do you think that he took accountability for this bank and for its failure? There were a lot of the saints that lost a lot of money. Joseph's grammar teacher told W. Weil that he had lost $2,500. I got for my money the blessing of the Lord, he said, and the assurance that by and by the notes of that bank would be the best money in the country. The toppling of the Kirtland Bank loosed a hornet's nest. Credit creditors swarmed in upon Joseph, armed with threats and warrants. He was terribly in debt. Thirteen suits were brought against him between June 1837 and April 1839, to collect sums totaling nearly $25,000. And a minute ago, I said that I was going to show a chart of a lot of their debts. So here it is. The damages asked amounted to almost $35,000. So you can see here that it has listed all the people that he borrowed from that he owed money to, the amount on the right, and then the total amount at the bottom. This does not include the suit of Samuel D. Rounds to collect the $1,000 fine for operating the bank without a charter. It also only includes those debts that were incurred before 1838. The original complete list, which includes debts incurred later as well, is found in the Library of the Reorganized Church in Independence. But I will also be showing those debts at a later time when, we're, when they're in Nauvoo. And in this chart, you're seeing the 13 suits that were brought against him between June 1837 and April 1839. Of the 13 suits, only six were settled out of court, about 12,000 out of the 25,000. In the other seven, the creditors either were awarded damages or won them by default. Joseph was arrested seven times in four months, and his followers managed to raise $38,428 for bail. Joseph had many additional debts that never resulted in court action. Some years later, he compiled a list of still outstanding Kirtland loans, which amounted to more than $30,000. With this chart that I've shown with how much he owed, if you added to that the two great loans of $30,000 and $60,000 borrowed in New York and Buffalo in 1836, it would seem that the Mormon leaders owed to non-Mormon individuals and firms well over $150,000. So let's see exactly how Joseph handles this. He faced his church in conference in April 1837. Large contracts have been entered into for lands on all sides, he said where our enemies have signed away their rights. We are indebted to them, but our brethren abroad have only to come with their money, take these contracts, relieve their brethren from the pecuniary embarrassments under which they now labor and procure for themselves a peaceable place of rest among us. This place must be built up and will be built up and every brother that will take hold and help secure and discharge these contracts shall be rich. It was a vain appeal to them. What they would consider the weak in faith left the ranks. At least six of the twelve apostles were in open rebellion, and Parley Pratt, whose rhapsodic eloquence had brought hundreds into the church, was even threatening to bring suit against the prophet himself. He wrote a letter to Joseph in May of 1837, which said in part, And now, dear brother, if you are still determined to pursue this wicked course until yourself and the church shall sink down to hell, I beseech you at least to have mercy on me and my family and others who are bound with me for these three lots of land which you sold to me at the extortionary price of two thousand dollars which never cost you a hundred dollars for if it stands against me it will ruin me and my helpless family as well as those bound with me for yesterday president rigdon came to me and informed me that you had drawn the money from the bank on the obligations which you held against me and that you had left it to the mercy of the bank and could not help whatever course they might take to collect it. Notwithstanding the most sacred promises on your part, 
that I should not be injured by those writings. I offered him the three lots for the writings, but he wanted my house and home also. Now, dear brother, will you take those lots and give me up the writings and pay me the $75 which I paid you on the same? Or will you take the advantage of your neighbor because he is in your power? If not, I shall be under the painful necessity of preferring charges against you for extortion, covetousness, and taking advantage of your brother by undue religious influence, such as saying it was the will of God that land should bear with such a price, and many other prophesyings, preachings, and statements of a like nature. Joseph threatened to excommunicate any saint who brought suit against another brother in the church, and he ordered Pratt to trial before the high council on May 29th, but the council itself was racked with schism and the meeting broke up in disorder. And Joseph said, Many became disaffected toward me, as though I were the sole cause of those very evils I was most strenuously striving against, and which were actually brought upon us by the brethren not giving heed to my counsel. That's in the History of the Church, Volume 2. So not only is he not taking any blame for what's happened, and not only blaming Warren Parrish, saying that he took money from the bank, but now anyone who has a problem with this and wants their money or says anything negative is going to be that or tries to sue for it will get excommunicated or made an example of and it's now it's failed because they didn't do what he told them to do joseph wrote in his journal it seemed as though the powers of earth and hell were combining their influence in an especial manner to overthrow the church at once and make a final end heber kimball was probably not exaggerating very much when he said there were not 20 persons on earth that would declare that Joseph Smith was a prophet of God. There was an article written by a Mr. Davis that said, The Mormons seem to have too much worldly wisdom connected with their religion, too great a desire for the perishable riches of this world, holding out the idea that the kingdom of Christ is to be composed of real estate, herds, flocks, silver, gold, etc., as well as of human things. And I find that interesting because I would say that a lot of people would say that that's not true, that we're not a worldly people. But you don't have to look farther than last year to see more financial scandals in the LDS church. It just came out in 2023 that they have been committing tax fraud for 20 years. And when they're asked why, it's because they didn't want people to know how much they made. Why? Because they, the people might stop paying tithing if they know how much money the church has. This is still a problem. They still have leaders that think that they can do whatever they want and that everyone needs to just fall in line and not have a problem with it. And just trust them. They're honest, even when they're not. John Whitmer, who was one of the witnesses of the Book of Mormon, made this statement concerning the conditions in Kirtland. In the fall of 1836, Joseph Smith Jr., Sidney Rigdon, and others of the leaders of the church at Kirtland, Ohio, established a bank for the purpose of speculation, and the whole church partook of the same spirit. They were lifted up in pride and lusted after the forbidden things of God, such as covetousness and, in secret combinations, spiritual wife doctrine, that is, plurality of wives, and Gadianton bands, in which they were bound with oaths, etc., that brought division and mistrust among those who were pure in heart and desired the upbuilding of the kingdom of God. William E. McClellan, who had been an apostle, said this, Soon, therefore, it is determined that a Kirtland bank must be established to hold their treasures and to aid them to get more. So eager were they and so sanguine of success that they did not even wait to get a charter from the state, but seemed to think that everything must bow at their nod, thus violating the laws of the land in which they live, which in the end brought upon them swift destruction. There are some that will now say, well, this was just banking. This has nothing to do with the gospel. So it doesn't matter Joseph Smith started a bank that failed and people lost money because that, that shouldn't have any weight on his status as a prophet. And people chose to invest. People chose to do this with their own money. And so it's not on him. In a meeting held September 3rd, 1837, John F. Boynton, who had been an apostle in the Mormon church, claimed that he understood that the bank was established because it was the will of God. Elder Boynton again rose and still attributed his difficulties to the failure of the bank, stating that he understood the bank was instituted by the will of God, and he had been told that it should never fail, let men do what they would. That's in the History of the Church, Volume 2. Warren Parrish, again, we talked about him a minute ago, who was then later blamed for taking money. He said, I have listened to Smith with feelings of no ordinary kind when he declared that the audible voice of God instructed him to establish a banking, anti-banking institution who like Aaron's rod shall swallow, swallow up all other banks. And then there's some people that might say, you can't believe what he said because he became an apostate. But Wilfred Woodruff, who remained true to the church and became the fourth president, confirmed the fact that Joseph Smith claimed to have a revelation concerning the bank. 
Under the date of January 6, 1837, he recorded the following in his journal. I also heard President Joseph Smith Jr. declare in the presence of F. Williams, D. Whitmer, S. Smith, W. Parrish, and others in the deposit office, and that proves that Warren Parrish was there when this was said, that he had received that morning the word of the Lord upon the subject of the Kirtland Safety Society. He was alone in a room by himself, and he had not only heard the voice of the Spirit upon the subject, but even an audible voice. He did not tell us at the time what the Lord said upon the subject, but remarked that if we would give heed to the commandment the Lord had given this morning, all would be well. Max Parkin quotes Wilford Woodruff as also saying, May the Lord bless Brother Joseph with all the saints and support the above-named institution and protect it so that every weapon formed against it may be broken and come to naught while the Kirtland Safety Society shall become the greatest of all institutions on earth. So again, they all believed this was revelation from God and that God wanted this bank made. Of course, the saints that truly believe in Joseph Smith are going to get involved in this. So then as we've talked about, afterward, they tried to blame the apostates or like in the saints books, blame the anti-Mormons. By the year 1864, the Mormon apostle George A. Smith had built up the story until it was absolutely ridiculous. He stated, Warren Parrish was the teller of the bank and a number of other men who apostatized were officers. They took out of its vault, unknown to the president or cashier, $100,000 and sent their agents around among the brethren to purchase their farms, wagons, cattle, horses, and everything they could get a hold of. It was the cursed apostates, their stealing and robberies and their infernal villainies that prevented that bank being conducted as the prophet designed. If they had followed the counsel of Joseph, there is not a doubt, but that it would have been the leading bank in Ohio, probably the nation. And that's in Journals of Discourses. But according to A. Metcalf, Martin Harris, one of the three witnesses to the Book of Mormon, said that the Kirtland Bank was a swindle. And about that time, Harris began to lose confidence in Joe Smith as a man of truth, honor, and principle, yet he believed him to be a prophet of God. Kirtland is split up. There are tons of people that are angry. There's people that are justifying Joseph that are blaming the apostates, that are blaming the anti-Mormons. And then there's the other people that are putting it back onto Joseph. Joseph now realized something has to happen to bring up morale and to get people's minds off of what is happening. He decides that the best way to ensure the loyalty of his men is to send them on missions where they could lose their petty grievances in preaching the purity of the gospel. So he established a mission in England. On June 1, 1837, Joseph appointed the big sloping-shouldered Heber Kimball to head a missionary group. With him went the repentant Hyde and able young Willard Richards. The English mission was thus born of disaster, and not even in his most extravagant daydreams could the prophet have envisioned its success. So when we start getting to later as people are coming over from England, it was a very successful mission. Joseph began to win back more of the ground he had lost. Many who had been ready to apostatize when the Kirtland Bank fell reconsidered when banks shut their doors everywhere. Joseph's speculation now looked more like an indiscretion than grand larceny. So it's working. Him, his excuses, them seeing other banks starting to fail, him sending people on missions. He is getting what he wants. He's figured out how to make people forget about this for a time. In mid-July, Joseph left on a five-week missionary tour to Canada, hoping that in his absence, the enmity against him would be still further dissipated. But he returned refreshed and invigorated to find that the church had split in two. The faction opposing him had rallied around a young girl who claimed to be a seeress by virtue of a black stone in which she read the future. David Whitmer, Martin Harris, and Oliver Cowdery, whose faith in seer stones had not diminished when Joseph stopped using them, pledged her their loyalty. That's another thing of when people talk about the witnesses. Well, they also started following a young girl with a black stone. I don't think these men had very good discernment. F.G. Williams, formerly Joseph's first counselor, became her scribe. Patterning herself after the Shakers, the new prophetess would dance herself into a state of exhaustion before her followers, fall upon the floor, and burst forth with revelations. It was disheartening to see jo to Joseph to see his prized three Book of Mormon witnesses apparently ready to witness still another dispensation. Before long, he silenced her. I don't know exactly how, but he chastised everybody and he got that shut down. Cowdery and Whitmer came back into the fold, half contrite, half suspicious and shortly thereafter went off to Missouri. Only Martin Harris, whose wagging tongue had become unbearable, was cut off from the church. So according to one Kirtland settler, Harris's mind, always unbalanced on the subject of Mormonism, had become so demented that he thought himself a bigger man than Smith or even Christ. Now, in his old age, Harris would rejoin the Mormon church. Joseph now felt free to test the loyalty of his saints in a conference and was once more sustained as president of the church by unanimous vote. But this was short-lived. Kirtland was fast disintegrating. 
Those saints who had means were moving to Missouri, not only because it spelled Zion, but also because it was West and everybody at that time was obsessed with getting West. Joseph, in the company of Sidney Rigdon, left for a visit to Missouri shortly after his return from Canada. His departure was doubtless hastened by the fact that six suits against him asking damages totaling 6,100 were pending in Chardon and court was due to convene on October 24th. It was impossible for him to meet these debts. During Joseph's time in Missouri, the Kirtland church just completely fell apart. There was a big fight in the temple and the dissenters set up their own church. They deluged the faithful with lawsuits, forcing many elders, including Brigham Young, to flee to Missouri to escape arrest. Joseph Smith's father and 16 others were arrested on a charge of riot, but the judge did end up dismissing the case on the ground that there was no cause for action. And you can go to Eliza Snow, who was later one of Joseph Smith's wives. You can go to her journals and Lucy Smith, his mother's journals, to find descriptions of this riot, this, these fights that broke out in the temple. The dissenters tried to secure the printing press with its 800 copies of the Book of Mormon, which had fallen into the hands of Grandison Newell, who is the person that they try to put all the blame for the bank on in Saints. Joseph returned from Missouri. He called for a public trial in the temple, determined that the sores that had been so long festering on the body of the church must be hacked out without mercy. L. E. Miller, who was present, related afterward that Joseph came into the gathering with a resolution and courage that the situation seemed to demand, and carried himself as one who felt that his soul and being had found themselves set firmly on the rock, while all else was but shifting of sand or swaying of reeds in the summer wind. Then, after Joseph, Rigdon took the stand. He was half sick and had to be supported to the pulpit. He had become a witch hunter and now accused the dissenters of a long catalog of crimes which included lying, stealing, adultery, counterfeiting, and swindling. Finally, when his energy was spent, he let himself be helped down the long aisle to the entrance and the congregation sat in silence while the temple doors closed behind him. After that, there came a big fight and counter charges were hurled back and forth. Joseph completely lost control and he had to shout over everybody to end the debate and have a vote for excommunications. And one of the dissenters yelled, you would cut a man's head off and hear him afterward. The meeting finally broke up and Joseph left the temple conscious that he had lost probably forever what he had spent time in Kirtland building. When word came that Grandison Newell had secured a warrant for his arrest on a charge of banking fraud, wonder why they try to put the blame on him in the church book. Joseph knew that this was the finish and fled in the night with Rigdon, with his horse turned toward Zion. After their prophet's disappearance, the dissenters seized the temple and within the walls that had so recently resounded with hymns to his glory, they passed resolutions proclaiming his depravity. On the night of January 15th and six, into the 16th, three days after Joseph's flight, the building housing the printing press caught fire and burned to the ground. Warren Parrish accused Joseph of being responsible for, for this saying that he had done it to prevent its printing matter against him and also to fulfill a prophecy that he had made that God would destroy Kirtland by fire for its wickedness. And of course, there's a lot of people that say Joseph already had left. He had nothing to do with this. But if you look at modern leaders of different LDS breakoffs, you know that when Irva LeBaron was put in prison, even after he died, his people were still killing people for him. You know that Warren Jeffs being in prison right now, there are still people out that believe in him and still would do his bidding. Joseph didn't have to be in Kirtland to have it be done on his orders. And I think that him ordering it is actually very believable because he later does order a printing press to be burnt to the ground for printing things about him that he said weren't true, but they were. And if he did make a prophecy about Kirtland ending in fire, it would make a lot of sense because he could then point to that and say, see, I told you, and people would believe he didn't have anything to do with it. I believe he did. Warren Parrish himself had come by this time to believe the worst of Joseph and Rigdon, whom he had once looked up to. I believe them to be confirmed infidels, he wrote, who have not the fear of God before their eyes. They lie by revelation, run away by revelation, and if they do not mend their ways, I fear that they will at last be damned by revelation. At this point, we see why the saints didn't stay in Kirtland, Ohio, and it isn't just because they were persecuted. So as you can see, Joseph Smith, even as the church began to grow, he still was constantly grasping for power and making revelations that would cause people to do what he wanted them to do. And then when they fail, blaming the people, never taking it on himself. Next week, we will be getting more into the move to Missouri.